you have people argue that sales is an art or sales is a science, and it's definitely both. To be able to speak in such a way that you move people, they listen, et cetera. That's part of sales, right? But when people get into sales, they think that sales is just being able to push someone towards a vision and being aggressive or assertive or any of those things. But it all happens when someone buys way before that. A lot of people skip that part and they just go like, oh, I can talk like this and I can talk however I want. I'm just going to ask you for the deal and I'm going to push you. But your upper echelon of salespeople, you can't even tell you're being sold, right? And there's an art to it. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 196 of ADHD for Smartass Women. I hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyoutsuka.com. My purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. And in the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something, not one. So for all of these reasons, I am just delighted to introduce you to Cheyenne Sampson, Cheyenne Sampson has been selling for close to three decades. She prides herself on having a deep love for all things sales and sales leadership. She built the well-known Yelp University sales training program, which is still being used both domestically and internationally, and also helped Zenefits, Varsity Tutors, Classy, Pet Desk, and many more software companies turn their sales teams around and increase revenue. Cheyenne has trained and developed over 4,000 salespeople and hundreds of sales leaders in her career. She's also the author of Triage Sales Coaching, a guide to help salespeople and sales leaders break down calls to increase performance. Cheyenne was diagnosed with inattentive ADHD almost 15 years ago, but she never thought of it as a benefit until recently. Cheyenne, welcome. Did I get all of that right? You did. Thank you, Tracy. And I can't tell you how excited and honored I am to be here. Well, I'm just delighted to have you. You have quite the background. But before we go into all of that, can we talk about your ADHD diagnoses first? Yeah. So I was diagnosed, (laughs) I hate to say this, but over 15 years ago, so in my 30s. And to be honest, I didn't think much of it at the time. I, like many other humans, I'm sure that have have either thought they had it or were diagnosed with an attentive ADHD, you just think textbook, oh, I can't pay attention, right? And I have hyperactivity and uh, I can't pay attention to things. And so I really didn't put much thought into it. And as I've gotten older, and I loved your your episode on on women going through menopause with ADHD because... I think that was game changing for me as well. But um, as I've gotten older, and especially through your podcast, I and to all the listeners, this what I'm about to say is not 
a commercial or advertisement, but man, Tracy, you have changed my life. I cannot tell you how much I've appreciated you. It's like having free therapy (laughs) and empowerment and yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't even want to get choked up about how impactful that you have been for me because I will be struggling with something and I'll literally go through and find one of your episodes. Um, rumination recently, the one on rum- <laughs> how we ruminate. I'm ruminating on something that is going on in my life right now. And so I pulled your your podcast to listen to it. So to your to your question, it didn't really impact me at the time. And I just kept. OK, my let me just say, like, first okay, of all. Thank you so much for your kind words. You know, I love the gold stars. So it just it makes me happy to know that my work is making a difference in your life. So thank you very much for that. So yeah, so tell us what were the circumstances when you were 30? Like what made you get diagnosed? Well, what's funny is I didn't even seek it out. It was it was um, just from a normal practitioner. You know, when you go in and you do your yearly exams with your general doctor. Right. Um, and she recommended, and it was funny cause it's a, she, but she recommended that I take this test and, and she thought that I lined up with ADHD symptoms and it comes back and yes, I have ADHD. And you know, what's funny is I think I always knew, I think I always knew. And in sales in the, in the industry that I'm in, everyone says they have ADHD. Oh, you know, ADHD, ADHD. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, me too. Um, but then when I got the diagnosis, genuinely, it really didn't change anything for me. Cause in my mind, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And everybody in sales has it. And yeah, I have it too. And okay, whatever. So what was going Um, on in your life, Cheyenne, that even made you like, what were you talking? I mean, if you're willing to share this with us, what were you talking to your doctor about that? She even thought, well, maybe you should get tested for ADHD. Like what was going on? (laughs) You know, what's funny is I think ADHD lines up really closely with anxiety and stress. Um, But I think that, (laughs) right. I think that that was it. It was, um, and I was having actually some heart palpitation issues and it came down to like anxiety or, or what have you. But then as I started talking about some of the things I was struggling with in terms of, you know, I can't pay attention and, um, I still stressed out all the time and this ability to focus. And um, it's so funny because it's so long ago that I don't even remember the exact conversation, but it was along those lines. Right. Yeah. And then that's where, and again, I just didn't think anything of it at the time. It was just, okay. And moving on. Um, I did, I was prescribed ADHD medication and I never took it. You never um, even tried it? it? Ah, uh, so I did try it. I didn't like the way it made me feel. Did it and make you more so anxious? It made me super anxious. Yeah. 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 And so I just went about my life. And then it only has been in the last few years that I've been more focused on it. And really, and then when I stumbled upon your podcast, you changed it for me in the way that I now see it as a superpower, just something that I need to understand how to navigate if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes it makes total sense. We have some weaknesses, but we also have some amazing strengths, don't we? Mhm. So I'm curious when you when Cheyenne was a child, a teenager, were there always symptoms of ADHD? Were there always things that you felt differently about than others and you were wondering like, well, why am I like that? Why do I do that? Yeah, and even more so in retrospect because there are some things that I knew I was different. And then there's some things that now that I look back, I thought everyone thought like that. And it, <laughs> that's not the case, right? Um, yeah. One of the things, one, I, growing up um, in school, I was always somebody, and then you've actually, I remember one of the episodes that you talked about this, but I was always somebody that, wasn't paying attention, was getting in trouble, et cetera, but could knock out a paper Mm -hmm. or any kind of assignment in like 15 minutes when it took other people, you know, significantly longer to do that. I could knock it out really quickly 
And they would, um, uh, and then everybody would say to me, you know, how did you get that done so quick? Like, you know, cause it would take them a lot longer and I would get A's. So I think you have an episode about people that didn't have to put a lot of effort in, but still get good grades. That was me, but I'd also get in trouble in class for not paying attention or, or not going to class. Cause I'd forget to go to class or what have you. And so um, now that I'm older and I look back on that, I thought it was me. I was like, well, I'm, I took what people had said to me or called me, you're a rebel, not a good kid, any of these things. And I just thought it was me, you Mm -hmm. know, I'm just not a good kid or I'm just a rebel or what have you. And um, now that I look back, I'm like, okay, (laughs) this is how my brain was working, but I'm proud of my brain and I love my brain because I've been able to accomplish a lot in my life. And I've been able to navigate all of those hurdles without knowing why or how or what have you. So I really love how my brain works and who I am, but it is different, right? In, in terms of what I see around me, you did one podcast um, where you said something about, we'll see somebody else come and they, they got the project done early and it was all well put together. And you look at them like, wow, that's a superpower. But now I realize that's how everyone's brain works. And my brain is different from that. And I think that also ties into the imposter syndrome, right? Because when I see people move in that manner and be able to complete tasks in that way, way ahead of time with attention to detail, and just, I look at that and I'm like, wow, these people are so much smarter than I am. I'm not as good as they are. You know what I mean? And so I think that that also ties into the imposter syndrome that you talk about that I think that us as women carry you know, right. as a heavyweight. So instead of looking at it as, oh my gosh, I must be so bright that I can pull that together in 15 minutes and it took that person an hour and 15 minutes, yeah. we look at it as, well, there must be something wrong with us because we didn't do it their way, right? And so it's yeah, not I'm legitimate. A it's not happens valid. Out at the end, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So Cheyenne, were you diagnosed as inattentive or combined type? Um, so combined, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I don't know if I've met a salesperson who's in a ton of, you know, exclusively, I would think you need some of the hyperactivity. Yeah, no, we, you definitely do. And it, and it's actually a strength in sales. So I think that that's why so many salespeople have ADHD and women in sales have ADHD is because in sales, our weaknesses are strengths. Right. Um, The drive, the Mm -hmm. hyperactivity, the we do things our own way. Right. All of those things help us win. And then our weaknesses, we have a saying in sales and we call it revenue hides all sins. I love that. (laughs) So good. Right. Yeah. But our weaknesses like lack of follow through impulsivity, all of those things can be overlooked by your leaders and are overlooked. And all the quirky things that come along with ADHD are overlooked if you perform and you can still be, you can still make a ton of money. You still be shouted out. Um, You don't have imposter syndrome because the, as a sales, well, you do every single month when you're back at zero, but when you're winning, (laughs) when you're winning, you feel on top of the world. Right. And so I think that that's why a lot of people do go into sales. So do you think that there are certain traits beyond the fact that we can get away with a lot that women with ADHD have? And that is why they, a lot of us tend to be attracted to sales. I mean, I certainly, I've done sales all my life. Yeah. Well, so here's what I'm, and mind you, I'm not an expert. This is just me and how I've been thinking about it, especially recently. Even I, I, you know, I had this young intern on my team most recently and she's talking to me and it was so funny. She's all over the place and she keeps forgetting what she's talking about. And I look at her and I go, you have ADHD, right? And she goes, yeah, how did you know? And I'm like, oh girl, uh, you're preaching to the choir. First of all, I recognize it. Second of all, I and that's so awesome her. for her, you know, that she has a boss who she can total. there's no shame, right? She can totally be herself. Oh, absolutely. And I think especially with women, and I don't want to, you know, say it's just women, but for sure. So in sales, sales is 
people think it's STEM, like science, technology, um, math, et cetera, uh, that is the worst when it comes to the male, female, uh, you know, equivalence, right, or mm-hmm. quality. Um, and actually, sales is one of the worst industries out there. When you look at salespeople, women make up close to 50% of the sales like workforce. But when you get up to sales leaders, it's about 29%. And then when you get up to C-suite, it's about 10%. And those are U.S. Bureau of Labor statistics. But Mm -hmm. so as a salesperson, you come in, you have ADHD, but you can, you can hide all of those weaknesses by performing. So you get called out and you're successful, et cetera. But as soon as you start start going into leadership, leadership declines significantly in terms of how many women are in there. So then your imposter syndrome kicks in, right? Your, uh, all the things you list, uh, the, the rumination, you name it, I think kicks in um, because you're, am I not good enough? Am I, is it me? I do have these weaknesses, right? And then it gets worse and worse as you climb to the top. Like for example, the company that I'm at now On the sales leadership side, I believe there's only one out of 200 plus sales leaders. I think there's one female VP sales leader. And then in the entire sales team, I think less than 10% of the entire sales team is female. And so I think it's a tough world to be in when you're female, when you have ADHD and your ADHD is really kicking up your imposter syndrome. I think it's a challenge. So I wonder too, for ADHD women, the higher up you get, the less you can hide behind Mm -hmm. revenue, right? Because executive functions are really called on, right? The planning, the scheduling, all of that stuff. Do you think that is what makes some of the difference, at least for those of us with ADHD? I mean, I... I would hate that. And you're dealing with all these neurotypicals, these linear brain type people, and you're sitting in these meet long ass meetings. Like it just makes my skin crawl even thinking about it. Oh, 100%. It's something I battle with every single day. So being on the executive team, um, I have, I have several teams that report to me in different functions, right. And global, So context switching between what my different teams do, context switching between cultural dynamics of having a global team, context switching between working with managers, directors, ICs, and then going back and working with strategy and and the executive team, and then having multiple projects running at the same time. I do the ADHD freeze quite often where I will just stare and, (laughs) and don't even know how to continue to move forward. And it's that, that frozen moment where I've got to get this thing done. Right. And so I use two methods. One, you've talked about organizational skills, writing things down. Um, That's my biggest thing. So I always have a notebook with me at all times, at all times. My notebook has a checklist of everything I need to get done. And I go through that checklist throughout the day. So you, other people would look at my checklist and be like, what is wrong with you? Because there's just the simplest things as like reply to this email. It's like, mm. okay, we'll just reply to the email. Why you took time to write it down. It's because I go through and look at all my emails. I look at all my projects every night. And then I write a list of all the things that I have to do. And then I use that checklist to get it done the next day. So one, checklists are huge, not just at work, but in my life, I use checklists. And that's how I've been able to accomplish writing a book, you know, building a house, do all these different things. Plus, you know, I hyper fixate and I, I am really yeah, driven. There's interest. Yeah, <laughs> there's interest. Who doesn't want to build a house? It's so fun. I think you said uh, in your strengths episode, I think episode 20 or something like that, you said we need positive emotion to move forward. Yeah. And um, yes, yes. If I get excited about something, oh man, look out. My kids are always like, oh my God, mom's on another project, right? So lists are huge. And then the other thing is I use Mel Robbins um, five second rule. Oh my God. Yeah, me too. It's so Do you? ridiculous that she built this whole career over five, five seconds. Five seconds. I'm sorry. It works, right? It does. 
It's the simplest, dumbest thing, but man, she nailed it. Okay, um, why don't you explain it so that if if a listener doesn't know what we're talking about, they will. Uh, it's so funny because I hate to do it because it's like then she's going to lose one book sale, but it really is simple. It's literally just when you're ruminating, when you're frozen, is it? And she doesn't focus on ADHD, but this is the way I'm translating it, right? Mm-hmm. But when you I'm know she frozen, does have ADHD, though she was diagnosed. does she. Yes. Wow, yes. Oh, that makes so and much And it's probably sense. why we were attracted to her five seconds. Uh, no wonder why she wrote the book. Good for her. Now I love it even more. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> so she says, when you're in those moments, take a step back and you count down from five, um, five, four, three, two, one, and whatever you're thinking you need to do. Cause you know, when you're sitting there staring at your phone and you're like, I shouldn't be staring at my phone. I should be doing something, but you're just frozen in time or, you know, you need to get something done or what have you that five, four, three, two, one. Well, when you get to one, you have to do the thing. So if you're dreading running, if you're dreading working on that project or what have you, five, four, three, two, one project five, four, three, two, one, put your running shoes on. Right. Yeah. And so that helps me so much. And then the other thing that I do, well, let me just say, that, so uh, what she's doing and the reason why it helps us so much is we're getting out of our head and we're getting into action, which means we're in our body. Yep. So when, when Mel, she was really depressed and she was struggling to get out of bed in the morning and she would, and, and I think it might've had something to do with getting up and running too. Um, and she was like, we would lie in bed and she would just while away, you know, hours. And so finally she was, the television was on and she saw some spaceship blasting off, you know, five, four, three, two, one, um, lift off. And she put two and two together and that's where it all came, where you're just getting out of your head, you know, because you're getting into action. And it, it's so simple, but it works. It does. (laughs) It works. And then I would say the third thing is it came from Jerry Seinfeld, but he was asked how he was able to write an episode every single week. And he said he would just, he had a goal of a thousand words a day and he held himself to a thousand words a day. And it's a version of that, right? Um, Where I, if I have a project like last night, yes, I, I work ungodly hours because I get so distracted because of meetings during the day Yeah, that at five, when my meetings end, I work, I have meetings from 6am to like five or 6pm. And then after my meetings end, I go have dinner or whatever, but then I spend from like six or seven to like 10, just knocking down projects. And I force myself, I have to tell my brain, finish this slide, finish this slide, finish this slide, finish this slide. Then after the slide, okay, now just finish this line, just write this title, Mm. you know what I mean? Or what have you. And then I get into a groove and I can knock out like three hours of building on or working on a project. So what you're doing, um, Cheyenne, is you're just telling yourself, all you have to do is this one little thing. And that then kind of sucks you in, gets you to start, and then you don't want to stop. Yep. Okay. So I'm listening to, I do that too, by the way. I, yeah, that's how I get everything done. I have a a Datex cube and it's got times all around it and it's, it's a timer. I only use the 25 minute one, except for when I'm uh, doing like office hours, then I use the five minute one to keep everybody, you know, on schedule. So if they're going to talk, they can only talk for five minutes, but the 25 minute one, I just put it on its end and that's how I start. And then once I start, I don't want to stop. That's awesome. My question for you. What is it? It's called a Datex cube. I've got one. It kind of looks like bamboo. Okay. I love I'm it. Have it's, to look that up. it's, you know, that when you're just sitting there or you're running around, and I typically never just sit there, but I'm running around, I'm cleaning, I'm doing, you know, procrastinating yeah. cleaning, doing, because that's what I do, doing anything I can to kind of get all the clutter away from my line of sight. And then I have nothing left to do. So I have to sit down and do what I need to do. <laughs> but even then, sometimes I struggle to start. And so I've just yeah. learned the deal I strike with myself is all you have to do is 25 minutes. You can stop after 25 minutes. And you'd think my brain would have caught on by now because I've been doing this for years. It never but fails. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, 
25 minutes and all of a sudden I'm sucked in again and I still haven't figured out that, oh, you know, you're, she's playing a trick with you. <laughs> I think our brains are like the, you know, biological version of a um, Labrador, right? Or a golden retriever in the sense of you just got to get them or, you know, like, oh, we're just going to do this. Okay. That sounds exciting. (laughs) Well, the golden retriever is my favorite dog ever. And I feel bad because I've got this little Shisu lying next to me. You know, I need to cover her ears. But yeah, they're one of the smartest dogs, which surprises me. But again, intelligence in dogs is related to whether they'll sit down, stay, you know, pay attention, listen to what you want versus the Shisu is one of the 10 dumbest dogs. But (laughs) it's ridiculous because the reason why they call them dumb, well, keep in mind, a Shisu was meant to float around on a pillow, right? To be carried around by staff on a pillow. It was bred for French, uh, not French, for Chinese royalty. And so Shisus are very stubborn and they're very independent and they do what they want to do and they don't listen. And I'm like, wait a minute, who's really the smarter dog, right? (laughs) Someone who, a dog who totally gets their needs met or a dog who listens to everything that, um, you know, that you say. So I'm now talking myself into the fact that I don't know that we're golden retrievers. We can be personality wise, but I think we've got a lot of that Shisu, right? We're we're going to do it when we want to do it. (laughs) Um, okay, so I, I'm thinking about what you're telling me, and I'm thinking about all this work, and clearly you're really good in sales, you're really good at training salespeople, you've got kids, do you ever think, why am I doing this? Why don't I just go back into sales? Revenue hides all sins. I don't have to work till 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, yeah, I literally have that thought 10 times a day. <laughs> yes, thanks, Tracy. Thanks for bringing that out. Um I do. And I, it's a lot of responsibility. And I think there's a lot of pressure. And I think, especially because one of my, one of my challenges, I, you know, with, with ADHD, you are socially awkward as well. Right. And I think as a leader, I have those moments and, um, okay. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you. Socially awkward. Granted, we're not here talking face to face. This is the first time I've met you, but what about you is socially awkward? Because I don't sense anything at all socially awkward. And I, yeah. I know that with ADHD, we say that a lot, but is that really true? Well, so what's funny is, and I'm an introvert and nobody believes either one of those things for me, but if you knew me and know what's going on in my brain and how my hands are sweating and how I can't wait to to get out of the room and all of those things. I just play it off really, really well. It's so funny. No one will believe me. I'll, I'll go to a sales event and I'll be, you know, on, so to speak, where I'm making conversation and getting other people to talk and doing all these things. And everyone's like, Oh, you're the life of the party. And I'm like, (laughs) if you only knew. (laughs) And then social awkwardness, like, I think you said it. I don't know if you use the word Tourette's, but you were talking about in one of your episodes, you were talking about how we just kind of will say things. Yeah. And oh my God. And then that, that paired with ruminating and being really hard on myself. Yeah. Everything that comes out of my mouth, I just am like, oh, dumb, dumb, dumb. I can't believe you said that. And then I just think about it constantly afterwards. Like, oh, I said this thing, whether or not anybody else thinks about it or not. And then, so then I just want to just hide, you know, I don't want to continue to be in these conversations (laughs) because I'm afraid of what I'm going to say or what have you. And I think all of that as a leader is a lot of pressure because you have to be, especially in this day and age, you have to be very on, very um, dialed in what you're saying, what you're doing, et cetera. And so I have to think about it every day, all day long. So it is a lot of pressure, but I also think it's just the path that, life has taken me, right? Um, I have, I love the people that work for me and I would walk through walls for them. And I love helping people grow in their careers. And I love watching them go off and do amazing things and make more money and do big, you know, accomplish what they didn't think they could accomplish. And so I love mentoring people and being a part of their growth. So I think that drives me to stay in, but yes, Tracy, I do think about it all the time. (laughs) So this is interesting. So it sounds like you say I'm socially awkward, but it really is more you feel socially awkward because clearly people around you don't think that. And 
you spend a lot of your time masking this, right? Yeah. And so I'm curious, is that your introvert qualities or is that your ADHD qualities or is it both? I think it's a Molotov cocktail, my friend. I think <laughs> that, do you know what I mean? I think it's it's like a, a perfect map. And I also think I have anxiety and I think all of that ties mm-hmm. in, right? And mm-hmm. so- I'm sure it's a little bit of everything. I think the ADHD part of me is the part that triggers it. So what I mean by that is when I'm out in public, I will, or when I'm with a group of people or in a conversation, one, I make a lot of inappropriate jokes. I tend to do that. It's funny that your podcast is called smart ass women because I'm definitely a smart ass, right? So I'll, I'll joke around or everyone's serious and I'm always the jokey one. And I'm like, oh, but then it's my um, introvert side that gets drained. And then I think it's my anxiety side that really kicks in. <laughs> Girl, I'm a mess. I don't know. But <laughs> I've learned to work it all out. And I think it's benefited me in time. And it's I'm starting to embrace it as just part of my personality. Well, and the thing about it is you are clearly such a good leader. And you're the kind of leader that should be leading. You have interns, right? Who are, you know, willing to admit to you that they have ADHD and they see themselves in you. And, you know, as you were saying, you, you grow people, you help them, you know, achieve things they never thought that they could achieve. So why not focus on that? I mean, clearly yeah. and you've done all these things, you've written these books, you've, you know, so that leads us perfectly to imposter syndrome. <laughs> and so before I ask you um, about imposter syndrome, just so our listeners know, it was a term that was coined in the 70s, and it's used to describe high-achieving people who don't recognize their accomplishments. They feel like they're a fraud. Their success must be an accident or a mistake. And I would surmise that most of the people who really suffer from imposter syndrome are women. And I wonder if most of these women who suffer from imposter syndrome aren't also ADHD. I mean, you just explained it, right? It makes so much sense that if you're always masking, you're working harder than everyone else to keep up, even though you're really good at what you do, you feel like that swan, right? Who's peacefully gliding across the water, but under the water, you're just paddling, you know, trying to keep up, trying not to drown. And we end up hiding this struggle from others, coworkers, you know, co-managers, you know, C-suite people, whatever, and the people that report to us, which causes a lot of shame. So talk to us about that. Talk to us about what's going on, because clearly you've had some experience with it. <laughs> well, and so I want to asterisk this conversation by saying I'm still deep in imposter syndrome and I don't have the answers yet, right? Because it's something I battle with constantly. So I can talk about my my current experience, but I'm not going to be able to help anybody else, right? Maybe through hearing it, but um, no, it's real. Cheyenne, I think how you help people though is they see everything you've accomplished And they're like, okay, it's not just me. Look, she's experiencing the same thing. And I really believe that if we can talk about it, we reduce the shame, you know, because we know we're, we're not all alone. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree, but I think as a senior leader, there's a balance I have to strike between that vulnerability and not exposing too much, right. In the sense of, Again, I work in a predominantly male environment. And one of the conversations I just had recently is I think that the reason why it's predominantly male is, especially in sales, you hire confidence over competence, right? And males tend to be very, very confident. And so, you know, when you get into an organization that's predominantly male sales leaders, et cetera, you'll start to look around and you realize, okay, there's a lot, there's a strong confidence model here. (laughs) But I think the competence could be a little bit higher, right? Yeah. So when you think about that, okay, if they're hired for confidence over competence, someone like me, I'm five, two, I'm a female, you know, I'm, I'm indigenous. There's a lot of, I have ADHD. There's a lot of strikes against me, but I walk into a room and I own it. 
I own what I say. I own what I'm doing, even if I have all of that going on underneath, because I know that it is confidence over competence, right? So that's why imposter syndrome becomes so deeply personal when you're at the top in the sense of it's something we very much have to battle alone. Because if we start in my opinion, and mm-hmm. I'm sure that this shouldn't this shouldn't be the reality, but it feels like it is, is that you can't divulge a lot of that. Uh, here's the other thing I do. I'm very impulsive. So I listened to one of your podcasts and then I went to meet with my leader who is the CMO and he's an amazing, amazing human. I adore him. But we went to, to meet and I get nervous. So I'm just like making jokes and just whatever. And then One of the things I said, and he's laughing and the group that we're with is like laughing at, you know, they're laughing at my different jokes. And then I remembered something you said is like, embrace the ADHD. You, you said in meetings, you'll say, well, that's my brain and that's how my brain works. Well, something came up and I said, well, you know, it's the ADHD in me. Oh my God. You could hear a pin drop. Everyone (laughs) quiet. Like, like I said that I was dying of, you know, some disease and I was like, it's not fatal, everyone. Like, it's just the way it is. Like, wow. And I kind of called out the awkwardness and everyone was like, ah, ha, ha, ha. Was like, <laughs> whoa, man, I should not have, it was just really bad timing. I don't know. And then, and then go back to my, my social anxiety where I beat myself up about that one for a while. But yeah, so I think that, I think it's a tricky balance, right, Tracy? I think when you're at the top balancing that little bit of a vulnerability, like I showed with my intern to say like, Hey, this is real. Here's some of the things you're going to battle and I want to support you. But also understanding that nobody knows what it means and to explain it is just, and then everyone thinks that they have those same thing. Oh, well, I'm late on projects sometimes, or I struggle with that sometimes. Right. And so it's just, you can't explain it. And so they just think you're hyperactive and don't pay attention so it's tricky. I, I haven't found the right, the secret sauce yet. I wonder if, because I agree with you, you know, if you're dealing with a bunch of linear neurotypicals, you know, the borings, as I like to call them, <laughs> they're not going to understand anything you're saying. And just like, you know, the reticular activating system works when we are buying a new car it's going to work in this case. So everything that you do, if there's any mistake or anything that happens, they're going to point to the ADHD, right? And they're going to say, oh, that's why, rather than it could have happened to anyone. And it had nothing to do with that. So I'm wondering if the way around it is, and you probably already do this, do you have a group of, you know, executive women that are in other companies at your level that you meet with to talk about these kinds of things that are in different companies? Um, so actually, no, no, I don't. Um, it is something I've been trying to work on. Mm -hmm. I think that I've always been very head down. I've never had a mentor. Mm -hmm. Um, I've never had a, up until now, my most recent boss right now just happens to be one of the most amazing humans. But up until now, I've never reported to someone that, taught me anything. I usually report to people that don't know what I'm or what my department does in terms of sales. And I just do what I need to do and get it done. Right. And I've mentored dozens of up and coming females, but I don't have a lot of peers in that way. So it's, I, it's something I've been working on, but I haven't um, built that network just yet. Well, maybe that's something to do. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's something that I've, I, you know, it's on my to-do list for sure. Because what you're telling me is you're talking about confidence over competence, right? Mm -hmm. And you work with a lot of guys who got a lot of confidence, but maybe not so much of the other. You, on the other hand, are completely confident. So what's going through your head? Those are just your thoughts. It's not true. And I think that the more you can talk about that with other women that you trust that are in a similar situation, I mean, you probably heard them on this podcast, right? Yeah. And that is why I think this podcast is so important because when you hear other people that are struggling with what you struggle with and they're, you know, at your level, maybe even higher than your level, you realize that it's, you know, it's not just you and 
perhaps it really is your thoughts that are getting the best of you because you're clearly competent. Yeah. And I agree with you. And I think that, you know, podcasts such as yours is a really great second best, right? I, I, I'm mm-hmm. sure that having that kind of network would be amazing. But it's so nice to just have it at my fingertips, right? Um, I think um, I think I pulled, oh, it's a funny one. I just uh, went to the dentist and, and I have to have a crown and because I grind, right? Yep. And then so I pulled your episode on. <laughs> crowns and root canals and grinding. And I'm like, oh, it's so helpful, right? And so I think, honestly, there's a lot of resources out there as well that you can pull up when needed to help you understand and navigate anything that you are experiencing. And that really has been game-changing for me. I have an idea, Cheyenne. You could go into our podcast I mean, into our big Facebook group, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, and say, Tracy told me to post this and specifically ask for executives at your level who struggle with imposter syndrome, and then you'd have a group. Yeah, that would be awesome. (laughs) I will do it. Do it. Do it. And then, yeah, come back and let us know how it goes, you know, as far as what impact did it have on you and your imposter syndrome? Before we get off the subject, though, I want to know, what is it that makes you struggle with imposter syndrome? Like, wh- what's it from, do you think? Oh, I think it's a compilation of things, right? So I have very humble beginnings. And, you know, you'll have people say, oh, I grew up poor. No, I mean, I used to dive in the garbage cans to find toys. We were very, very poor. We went without mm. food quite a bit. It was just me and my mom. And, um, you know, she worked two to three jobs serving, et cetera, but we were very, very, very poor. Mm -hmm. And I have no family. Um, I, nobody in my entire family on either sides has ever gone to college and I'm not connected with anybody except for my mom. And so starting there, I think is tough because everybody that I work with even if they say, oh, you know, I had a tough upbringing, it's usually like, oh, you know, we only went out to eat once a week or <laughs> yeah. we weren't allowed to buy soda or, you know, my parents got divorced and I'm like, you had two parents. It's great. But I think that because of my upbringing and I've really had to work on the way that I speak because I, I grew up getting into a lot of trouble and hanging around with a lot of people that got in trouble. And I had a pretty wild first, you know, quarter of my life. And so to get through that and fit into a world in the world that I'm in, everyone comes from education and affluence. I I very seldom run run into Mm -hmm. people that have made it through a, a lot in the way that I have. And then I'm a single mom to, um, you know, I have three daughters and I have two adopted sons and wow. I've been a single mom their whole lives. And that, you know, I'm working hard and behind the scenes and I was a young mom. And now when I work with people, they're my age now that have little ones and my kids are all grown. Cause I had them, um, you know, when I was very, very young. And so I think that that ties into imposter syndrome because my, I don't, align with the people around me, regardless of my accomplishments. And then when my ADHD kicks in, right. And I hyper focus on those factors and how I'm speaking. And, you know, I just overthink all of it, even my book. So I wrote my book and it's strangely becoming very successful. It's being picked up by some pretty recognizable companies. But every time I talk about my book, the first thing I talk about is, well, you know, I didn't put a lot into the aesthetic and it's not as good as I wanted and blah, blah, blah. And I actually got feedback from somebody that was like, I didn't even want to read your book because the first thing you said was it wasn't as good as you. Yeah. And I'm like, no, no, just aesthetically, the content's really good. (laughs) I, I don't know. And so I just think that, you know, I think it's the insecurity from that background tied in with just me overthinking everything and, And so I just constantly have to remind myself, like, look what you've accomplished. Look what you've accomplished. And um, 
but it's it's a daily battle, to be honest. I can't talk myself up and then stay in that mindset for weeks or a month or whatever. I, every day I have that conversation with myself. So Cheyenne, it sounds like there's some trauma. Have you ever considered that? Because, oh, for we, sure. Yeah, oh, I mean, yeah, we think trauma means, you know, some violent crime happened to you. I mean, trauma can be something as simple as having no support, growing up very, very poor, you know, and I, I want to recommend a book. Yeah, I love books. It's a great audio book because, so let me tell you what the name is. It's called What Happened to You? And it's by Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey. Okay. And so Oprah Winfrey has this girl's school. I think it's in South Africa. And she was, you know, all the girls that come to the school are on scholarship. And they were coming from, you know, homes that had dirt floors and one room and everybody slept in the same. I don't even know if they slept in beds, you know really, really poor girls. And they were given this lifetime opportunity, right? To go to this brand new girl's school that um, was founded by Oprah Winfrey. They had, you know, brand new clothes, I guess their uniforms, three square meals a day. They had this incredible education, all of this given to them. And within two weeks, a lot of the girls would just run away. And she was like, what is going on here? This doesn't make any sense to me. So she brought in Dr. Bruce Perry. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. And he was like, well, even if their home situation was worse and, you know, girls, you know, they were abused, all of these things, it was familiar. And so that's yep. what they always gravitated back towards. So that's how she started working with Bruce Perry. And what is so good about the book is I didn't think, I'm very sensitive and I was afraid that I couldn't handle it because, you know, just the details and the stories that I'd just be so upset about it. But the stories for the most part are so beautiful. I don't remember one story that really, really bothered me. There was just such good stories, right? They were so illustrative of what they were trying to explain. And, you know, Oprah Winfrey is such a good storyteller and Bruce Perry's a really good storyteller as well. Yeah. And he has decades of experience on trauma but I think that that book might help you understand what's going on. Yeah. So Ooh, I, would, I'll pick it up. I would highly recommend that book. And then there was something else that I was thinking of. And now I can't think of what it was. Oh, heck. You know, there's another <laughs> book, um, which is more kind of the Bible of trauma. And it's by um, Bessel van der Kolk. And it's called The Body Keeps the Score. But that one is harder. Because I feel like, you know, when I read it, I had to have, you know, an outline, you know, an outliner or a highlighter and I needed cards and notes and I had to type it into my computer and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so it, it's just so much harder to get through versus what happened to you. I think I finished it in a couple of days just listening to it because it was so interesting and so well done. And I the storytelling is just it just sucks you in. Oh, I'm excited. But I just have to say that. Oh my gosh, you're clearly so good at what you do. And it's not just sales, right? It's not just you selling and making a lot of money and doing well. It's you going in and changing other people's lives. It sounds like a lot of other women's lives. And you're just, you're a mentor and you're so good at what you do. And then you're a single mom and you have three daughters and two adopted sons. I just take my hat off to you. You, I, I mean, I just can't believe that you've been able to accomplish everything you've been able to accomplish. And so my big question for you is, do you celebrate your successes? So I think I would, my question would be define that, right? I think every day I wake up grateful and I, I think I celebrate in the sense of, I know I'm very lucky to have the life that I have and I'm very grateful to have the life that I have, but I think I would ask you to define what you mean celebrate. <laughs> um, something more than I'm talking about the specific things that you accomplish. So if you listen to the podcast, you probably know about reward deficiency syndrome, which is yep. common, right? With those of us with ADHD, number one, we feel less motivation to work towards a reward, but then once we reach our goal, 
we get to the reward and we feel less satisfaction from this, the reward. So we just kind of jump into the next thing, which is exactly why we feel like we haven't ever accomplished enough. And I think that's another reason why those of us who have ADHD also have more imposter syndrome. And so it's, a, it's different for everybody, but when you accomplish a goal, what do you do? Like when you finish writing your book, did you celebrate it? And how did you celebrate it? Was it just like, no. oh, I'm grateful it's done. <laughs> Next. No. So what, it's so funny. You said that just now. And one, I was like, oh, I can't believe I'm on a, a podcast with her. Because that, when you said that in one of your podcasts, it really resonated with me. I said, oh, that's why I do that thing where I have a list of goals and I just cross them off. The moment that I cross it off, like, okay, that that's good. But it's really just getting it done, right? And like you said, people will celebrate when they get so excited. And I'm like, oh, yeah, people do do that, huh? <laughs> no, I'm not that person. Um, I The second it's done, I'm almost like, okay, that, now what do I, I need to work on something else. What else do I need to work on? I need to build something else because I'm very handy on my house. So I'm always building something or fixing something. I need of course to write you something. are. Is there anything you can't do? But I'm like, I'm writing a second book right now. And I'm like, I need to write that book. And and then I'm thinking, wow, I really need to write more than that book. I need to write this other book. And I'm like, oh, I need to start this podcast. And like, you know what I mean? I don't know. And so if I'm not working towards something, I think I get into a funk. And so I have to have these goals and things that I'm pushing towards. And it's not really accomplishing them exactly like you said. I mean, you nailed it, Tracy. It's not accomplishing it. It is just doing it, like getting it done and, and constantly working towards something. And I actually think that's a superpower of mine. That's how I've been able to go as far as I have been able to go. It's just because I'm constantly have that drive to accomplish something. Well, and that's dopamine, right? You have realized yep. that I, I used to call this post final I still call it post-final depression. I noticed when I was in college, all my friends would be so excited about, oh, it's the end of finals and we're going to do this. We're going to go down to LA for a weekend. We're going to go to the, you know, this a restaurant and, you know, just you know, sleep in and blah, blah, blah. And I remember I'd be like, okay, let's do it. And they'd be all excited after finals. And I'd be like, okay, next, you know? <laughs> Because I didn't get that same, you know, sense of satisfaction. And I also did not know how to celebrate. Now, I'm half Japanese and half German. And I think part of it is cultural. Like nothing's ever really good enough, right? We're always yep. trying to make it better. But when I changed that and I really made a concerted effort to celebrate the smallest steps, I'm telling you, it made such a difference. And I started to understand how much I accomplish. Well, I don't look at it every day because you know how we are, right? We can, you know, do a month's worth of work in one day and then we won't do anything for the rest of the week. And then we beat yeah. ourselves up all of those other six days that we didn't really do much. Yeah. But when we look at it as a week or as a month, then we can see everything we've accomplished. But everything I do now, it ends with a way to celebrate. And it's hard for well, me. So what do you do to celebrate? Let me think about this. <laughs> um, I, I go to New York City a lot. <laughs> um, I will set out specific, like we are going to dinner at this place specifically to celebrate this. And I may have done that before, but it was in my head. I didn't tell other people because I felt like, oh, that was, uh, uh, what's the word where, you know, it's just all about me. I, I can't think of what oh, the word is right now. So it was indulgent. Yeah, indulgent. Yeah. It was indulgent versus now it'll be, we're going out for dinner and we are celebrating this accomplishment of mine. And I will make a point of if nobody else makes a toast for me, I'll make a toast for me. I want concrete, specific things. And, you know, my kids are grown now. So it's not like I can do things with them all the time, although they're my favorite. My husband and my kids are my favorite people. But I make sure it is something concrete. It's not just, oh, I'm grateful for that. And then it's, it's on to the next thing. Because like you, I was doing that too. But I am telling you, when you make a concrete, um, uh, you know, I'll schedule weekends away that, you know, we're going to celebrate this. Um, I hate birthdays. 
but I have made a point of now I need to celebrate birthdays. I, I just, I hate them. I, I feel like, oh, it's just more time passing and I'm running out of time. Yeah. But same. once I'm there, I feel so good that I did it. So I really think that that might be the first step. And I know you've got so much on your plate. And it might be even getting the kids. Like it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be you're going on a trip or you're going out to dinner. It literally can be sharing it with your kids, right? And then buying a bunch of streamers and hats and, you know, whistles. Because then what you're teaching them is you're teaching them how to celebrate their successes too. So everybody for, you know, five minutes is just jumping around the house and all excited for your accomplishment. Yeah, I agree. Especially I have three daughters and they all have ADHD too. Yep. And that's one of the things that I've been trying to work on is is exactly what you just said because they need to celebrate their own accomplishments, celebrate themselves, put themselves first, right? Some of those yes. things and I'm just now learning how to do those things. So I'm trying to to model that even though it's a bit later. <laughs> I am trying to model it. It's not that late. <laughs> Truly, yeah. it's not that light. I don't know what will work for you. Everybody's different. But I suspect that if you try just once and do a little one and then really get into your body and pay attention, does this generate positive emotion for me? That's our rudder, right? Whatever generates positive emotion, but good positive emotion. I mean, you know, we can have, you know, five drinks and I guess while we're drinking them, some people will feel positive emotion, but then afterwards it's not so good for us. <laughs> yeah. So if you, because that's our rudder. So if we can just constantly follow the positive emotion, then we know that, okay, I'm doing the right thing. And how does that make me feel about me? Because I wonder, is it with you, a lot of it is, you're not worthy of that celebration. And so we're going to downplay that accomplishment because it really isn't that big a deal. Anybody could do it. And that is not true. I mean, look at everything you've accomplished. It's insane, actually. You know, <laughs> it. And so when you talk about, oh, you know, I'm around other executives and they all come from these Tony families and they've had everything handed to them, what you've accomplished given where you had to start is so much more impressive. You've accomplished so much more. You're, you know, like, how do you even compare the two? So I would listen to what you say way more than I would listen to someone who basically, you know, was handed, what is it, the silver spoon and, you know, was handed everything. Tracy, I don't, I, you literally <laughs> are the best thing that has ever came into my life. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm I sure that's not true. Goodness. But, but, well, but I'm mean, not going to, you know, outside of my family, I think yeah. it is true. <laughs> oh, well, that gives me positive emotion. So clearly I am doing the right thing and I'm in the right place. You are. <laughs> so before we go, wait, I, okay, this is going to be a little long, sorry, but I want to know, why did you decide to write your book, Triage Sales Coaching? Um, yeah, so it's a coaching method I developed at Yelp. I had been training 30 to 60 new salespeople a month and training five to eight new sales managers. We would take salespeople, move them into management roles. And mind you, the median age in this entire group was about 23, 24. So they had never really sold before. They definitely had never coached on sales calls before. So I had to develop a method that taught sales managers and new green salespeople how to break down a sales call to increased performance. So I just developed this method of taking a piece of the call, the most, the most like critical piece of the call first. That's why I call it triage after the medical term, right? You take the most life-threatening or critical piece and you work on that first before you work on anything else. So I developed this method that, that breaks down sales calls piece by piece and is a deep practice, right? And the beauty of it is it's not a sales methodology. So you can take any methodology that you're using. You can take Sandler, uh, Challenger, Spin, Medic, whatever it is. This doesn't replace that. This just helps you break down sales calls. And I didn't know why it was so successful. It just became so successful. And people kept saying, you know, the one thing you taught me that would, was really game changing was Trials. You should write a book. You should write a book. So I ended up writing the book. And I didn't know why it was so successful until I read Daniel Coyle's the talent code. So he does research around the world, 
trying to understand why there's these pockets of talent, whether it's musical talent, athletic talent, whatever. And what he deduces is it's not in the water. It's not genetics. It's (laughs) not any of those things is there are coaches around the world that have tapped into this method of deep practice and how the myelin wraps around your nerve fibers as you're learning to solidify a piece of that music, a piece of that, you know, sports play, whatever it is. So when I read Daniel Coyle's book, the light went on and I said, oh my God, that's why triage works because it's deep practice and it and it makes you focus down and perfect each piece to put it together as a masterpiece. So that's where triage came from. So it changes your brain. Changes your brain. Hmm. Okay. So I got, <laughs> I have to tell you a quick story. So my husband has been in sales forever. And prior to kids, you know, he was chief operating officer and like, you know, he ran companies and he is so good at sales, but he's also extremely neurotypical. When I first met him, I looked at his calendar and I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Like everything is written down and he just crosses everything off. He doesn't ever not follow, you know, he sets his intention and he doesn't ever not follow it. And superpower. Um, <laughs> I have no idea how he's like that, but he is. He's the kind of person who will on a Friday afternoon, like at four o'clock, will go into his office and he will make 50 sales calls. So when my kids were born, he went back into sales so that he'd have more time with the family. And he's been in sales since then. 50 sales calls on a Friday afternoon. So I decided, okay, I'm going to try to be like rich. And I remember taking this program. I was at the time, my kids were young and I was uh, working as a real estate broker, luxury real estate. And I said, okay, I'm going to go back to my clients and I'm going to do what rich does. And I'm going to make, you know, 50 sales calls. Of course, it wasn't a Friday afternoon. I I think it was sometime in the morning because I couldn't possibly do it on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, no. (laughs) And I started, I started with the first call. I could not get off the phone in under an hour. And I was just like, (laughs) I can't do this. I cannot have a five minute conversation with anyone. I mean, that's probably why, you know, I'd love to do 25 minute podcasts but I can't do it because once I get in and I start talking to people, I can't leave. Right. So I'm curious, you know, how you break down calls. I mean, is this a problem that you see in a lot of salespeople where, you know, they can't make a five minute phone call? I mean, here's the thing. It starts from, <laughs> I love that story. It's great. Um, it starts from even just understanding that your tone is everything, right? Being able to set an agenda, how to control a call. There's so much that goes into sales. You know, you have people argue that sales is an art or sales is a science, and it's definitely both. I think there is an art to sales, and I think there is science to sales. But the ability to communicate at that level and and regardless of political preference or leaning, I'm not talking politically, Mm -hmm. but you look at someone like Obama, right? And the Mm -hmm. way that he speaks, that is an art form to be able to speak in such a way that you move people, they listen, et cetera. That's part of sales, right? But when people get into sales, they think that sales is just being able to push someone towards a vision. And, you know, being aggressive or assertive or any of those things and closing or handling objections and and short closing, handling objections, et cetera, is a part of sales. But it all happens when someone buys way before that. For example, let's talk about your podcast, your podcast. You sell people in the first few minutes by how you speak. When someone's going through podcasts, I was going through there's a bunch of ADHD podcasts out there. Right. And I'm, I'm going through them. And the tone of the person right out, right out of the gates, how they're speaking. Is it something I'm interested in? Is it something that uh, is going to grab my attention? Then second, how do they make me feel? Right. And that's sales. A lot of people skip that part and they just go like, oh, I can talk like this and I can talk however I want. I'm just (laughs) going to ask you for the deal and I'm going to push you. And that's an aspect. And I think there, there are salespeople out there that are like that and still are successful, but your upper echelon of salespeople, you can't even tell you're being sold, right? And there's an art to it. Oops. And that's where that comes from. And so it doesn't matter what kind of sales you're in, because frankly, 
honestly, I think we're all in sales, right? We all have a point of view and we want to sell it to other people. So is your triage sales coaching book, is that something that could help anybody? No, I think it is sales specific. And I hear that all the time. We're all in sales. And I'm like, yeah, but when you carry a quota, there's a whole different ballgame, right? There is a sales aspect in meaning, understand how to convey a vision, tell a story, Mm -hmm. uh, get people bought into whatever value you're trying to convey. Yes, there's a sales aspect, but then there's a whole other ball game to sales in that carrying a, a bag, right? Carrying a book of business that you, and having quotas and your job is on the line every month. And, you know, there's a sales aspect as well. Uh, triage is specifically teaches people how to manage on sales calls. Do I think that there's an aspect that humans could take and say, check my tone, check my agenda, check my confidence? Sure. But it's definitely a sales methodology or sales uh, approach. Well, I'm going to have to buy it for my husband. Okay, Cheyenne. So what do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD is? I would say, especially what I've discovered recently is embrace it, embrace it, embrace it as a superpower, do your research, surround yourself with humans that you you can speak to and that would understand you. And again, embrace it. I mean, my thinking around it now is just so positive. And Tracy, you've really helped me with that in the sense of I use your podcast like Wikipedia in the sense of I'm like, if I'm experiencing something, I look for an episode that talks about it, right? Because I think that understanding it and using what we used to probably perceive as weaknesses as strengths, but just adjusting accordingly is game changing. And then also keep lists, like keep a list. Write, you write your list and that's how it, you can continue to move forward and accomplish things. But um, kudos to you and the support that you're giving to the community of all of us ADHD women out there. And please keep doing it because I need you. Aww. That's So that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. So Cheyenne, are you working on something that you want to tell us about? Like where can people find you to know more about you and what you do? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can go to my website, uh, com. I'm also on LinkedIn. My book is the, the biggest thing out there right now. I have triage sales coaching, but I also do consulting for my favorite or, you know, a series A through C startups for their sales teams, building process and helping sales teams excel. But if you look out there, I'm definitely out there. Okay, so CheyenneSampson.com, and that's S-H-I-A-N-N-E-S-A-M-P-S-O-N.com, correct? Yes, ma'am. And the book is Triage Sales Coaching, and you can find that on Amazon? Yes, you can. Wonderful. So this is all going to be in our show notes. Cheyenne, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. Tracy, it was an absolute honor, and I'm excited to to keep listening. Thank you. Absolutely. So thank you again. And that is what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Cheyenne, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart-ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.